Good evening. Can you hear me? Awesome. Good evening. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight to hear Liza Mundy discuss her new book, Code Girls, The Untold Story of the American Women Codebreakers of World War I. My name is Michelle Fernandez, and I am a program... World War II, I'm so sorry. <laughs> My name is Michelle Fernandez, and I'm a Programs and Partnerships Librarian here at Arlington Public Library, and in case you can't tell, I'm new. <laughs> we would like to thank our partners from One More Page Books for being here tonight and supplying copies of the book for sale. At this time, I would like to ask that you silence your cell phones as we begin. Liza Mundy is a journalist and author of four books. She is a former staff writer for the Washington Post, where she specialized in long-form narrative writing, and her work won a number of awards. Her 2012 book, The Richer Sex, was named one of the top nonfiction books of 2012 by the Washington Post and a noteworthy book by the New York Times Book Review. Her 2008 book, Michelle, a biography of First Lady Michelle Obama, was a New York Times bestseller and has been translated into 16 languages. Her 2007 book, Everything Conceivable, received the 2008 Science and Society Award from the National Association of Science Writers as the best book on a science topic written for a general audience. She writes widely for publications including The Atlantic, Politico, The New York Times, Slate, and Time. In keeping with the theme of Ms. Mundy's research, the library's Center for Local History, where she performed some of her research, has compiled an exhibit on Arlington Hall, which was taken over by the US government in June 1942 as their new location for military intelligence and cryptanalysis work, and became a central hub for the Women's Army Corps. Stop by their table outside, uh, where they have some codes available for you to try your hand at some cryptanalysis. They have beginner and then advanced, so you can sort of make your way through. The Center for Local History is going to be launching a new digital collection on Arlington women this coming March, and a sneak peek was posted this week on the library blog. You can find out more about them uh, by visiting the Center for Local History here in the library in person, um, or online at library.arlingtonva.us. Following Ms. Mundy's presentation, there will be a Q&A, so please line up at the center uh, microphone to ask your questions. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Liza Mundy. Thank you so much. Um, and in fact, there is a chapter in my book on World War I, and there were a number of uh, female pioneers who came out of World War I. So that was an important, uh, that was an important actually origin point for our, our code breaking uh, abilities such as they were. Uh, it's a particular pleasure to be speaking to an Arlington audience. I am a longtime Arlingtonian, uh, long time enough to have raised my children uh, and schooled them in Arlington. And so I am a, a grateful patron of the Arlington Public Library, both as a reader myself, uh, and I certainly brought my children to the children's section, and I think we ex uh, tried to exhaust it, although that would be hard to do. Um, and also, when I was doing the research on this book, you know, much of which takes place in Arlington and really, uh, you know, really deepened my understanding of our landscape. Uh, I, I did research at the local history center here at the library and just want to thank John Stanton and the other archivists for being so helpful and providing me with resources that I really didn't think I was going to be able to find. Uh, my central character in the book, um, and I'm going to her book party tomorrow. She's 97, and she's very excited. Uh, uh, she was a school teacher in Chatham and came on the train not knowing what she would be doing to work to take a government job in Washington in 1943. And, uh, she lived for a while at a place called Arlington Farms, but then uh, that was very crowded, and they moved to an apartment in, in uh, Fillmore Gardens. And I wanted to, uh, she remembered moving into Fillmore Gardens. It was new. Uh, she remembered that there was just kind of a lone building. That was her memory. But of course, in doing work where I'm, I'm mining the memories of people in their 90s about something that had happened 70 years ago, you know, when I can barely remember something that happened three days ago, I, I wanted to know more about the uh, apartments in, in Arlington and when they were built. And, and I, I didn't think that they would have a resource like that here. But lo and behold, John Stanton, when I got there, had set out. There was a, somebody had written a thesis, of course, on 
on the on the garden on the the garden apartments of Arlington, and and there was one on Fillmore Garden. There was actually a paper on Fillmore Gardens uh, that confirmed her memory that it was being built during the war to house largely the women who were coming to work in Washington, and that there that a portion of it was built before the rest of it was built. So it was extraordinary to me uh, the kind of rich resources that that the library has and that they were able to confirm these, you know, sort of fragmentary sometimes memories. And similarly, there were several times when I needed rare, uh, pretty rare war, war documents, kind of temporary reports on the sorts of meetings that were being held to try to find labor during the war. And the, um, the interlibrary loan section several times came through with documents that, again, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to procure. So I am so grateful for this resource, uh, amazed that it's five minutes from my house, and, and, and grateful also to the library for uh, providing a space for talks like this. I'm also very grateful to my favorite Arlington bookstore, One More Page. Um, I've spent too much money there. Um, <laughs> I have a particular weakness for your incredibly well curated thriller and mystery section, so I need to start doing some Christmas shopping, um, perhaps for myself as well. Uh, and, and also, I'm very grateful, I have to add, um, every author fears the book talk where there's one or two people there, uh, m most of whom are related to you or have, uh, or have come in off the street and aren't quite sure why they're there, but do listen politely. Uh, and, um, when I, with my last book, I gave a talk uh, in the wonderful space at One More Page, and um, and they had and you never know when you go in, like, is anybody going to be here? And uh, and and they had ingeniously to ensure that people would be uh, be there. They had offered to. Um, a class, they had gotten a teacher either at George Mason or at uh, Nova to offer as extra credit to their class uh, <laughs> coming to the talk, which was so brilliant. So I had all these, you know, in addition to, you know, a nice size regular audience of grown-ups, uh, uh, really engaged 20-somethings, you know, and how often does that happen at a book talk because 20-somethings are, are really busy people. So I, I really had this grateful memory. Uh, so, so anyway, I just wanted to take a little time to thank our wonderful local institutions because I really am grateful to be an Arlingtonian, and um, and and much of my talk will focus on uh, on the Code Girls of Arlington Hall and the school teachers who came up from the South to sink the shipping of Japan, which they did. Uh, and and I'm but I'm going to start with uh, with an institution that is also pretty close to here that may be familiar to some of you. Um, uh, behold the uh, May Court in 1942 uh, at Goucher College, which some of you may be familiar with. It's in Towson now, um, in suburban Baltimore, but it was in 1942 uh, in urban Baltimore. And it was a, a very uh, characteristic women's college in the sense that it was created like so many women's colleges were because so many colleges were closed to women. So many male colleges were closed to women uh, still in the 1940s. Uh, and it was a fine institution uh, with a combination of, of young women who had come from elsewhere uh, to get an education and also urban, urban young women from Baltimore, who, uh, many of whom were on scholarship, uh, who were attending college at a time when only 4% of American women completed a four-year degree. Uh, in, in part, those numbers were small because there were so few jobs available to college-educated women, particularly women uh, with a liberal arts education, with a great liberal arts education. And, uh, and so pretty much all they could hope for when they graduated was being school teachers. So many families didn't consider it worthwhile to educate a girl uh, because there were so few jobs that she could expect. You know, law, medicine, architecture, engineering, most of those graduate schools were closed to women or at best admitted, you know, one or two a year. So Goucher, very fine school. The dean, Dorothy Stimson, was an expert on Copernicus. She was a, you know, a, a well-known scholar of science and scientific achievement. Their English teacher, Ola Winslow, was the first uh, woman to win a Pulitzer Prize for biography. So very distinguished faculty. The young women at Goucher were getting a top-notch liberal arts education, very motivated student body, but most of them could expect afterwards either to teach school or to marry. And, and, and so they were also being prepared basically for marriage. And many of them dated and, and, and actually incessantly traveled to the Naval Academy, which is 20, 20, 20 miles away from, from Goucher. Uh, they were called Goucher Girls. And, uh, and they were, I mean, I, I've interviewed.
full of them. And they you know, spent a lot of their time in Annapolis in, in boarding houses there for dances and things like that. So of course, this is May of 1942. And the young women are being you know, ushered in their sort of virginal dresses, presumably into their, uh, their, their post-collegiate life uh, of marriage. That, that's what you would expect. Uh, but of course, May 1942, we've been in World War II now for six months. Most of these young women have brothers and boyfriends and fiancés who are now shipped out to the Pacific or shipped out to the Atlantic. And meanwhile, what nobody knows about this group of young women is that Jackie Jenkins, uh, who would eventually be Jackie Jenkins Nye, mother of Bill Nye the science guy, um, and you can see where he got his chops, and Gwyneth Gaminder, and at least 10 of their classrooms were already secretly training, had already been secretly tapped by the US Navy to train in something they had never heard of called cryptanalysis. So they had already been identified either by Dean Stimson, who happened to be the cousin of Secretary of War Henry Stimson, um, uh, and it, and it, who had put in a quiet word with his cousin for her best senior girls. Uh, so these young women had already been tapped and were training in a locked classroom where they were being trained by Ola Winslow and a naval officer in a tradition of code breaking that went back to the Renaissance. So they were learning about things like visionaire tables and ways to scramble letters and the behavior of the English alphabet, letters that traveled together like S and T or ING and how to do a frequency count of, of, of a sentence to, to see if letters had been scrambled, which, which what, uh, what letters might be stand, standing for other letters. Uh, they were pulling strips of paper through cardboard, learning techniques that had been honed in Europe over hundreds of years. Uh, and the reason that they were doing this secretly without telling anybody was, of course, because of Pearl Harbor. Um, on December 7th, 1941, you know, one of the, one of the greatest intelligence failures of our nation's history, uh, one of the, the, the surprise attack where Japanese bombers and fighter planes attacked really just about our entire Pacific fleet in Pearl Harbor. Uh, this, of course, was an event that the Japanese thought was going to bring America to its knees and demoralize us. And to the contrary, the very next day, uh, young men started heading for the recruiting stations and shipping out very quickly to the Pacific, to the Atlantic, to Europe. We were in the war. We had known that it was coming since the fall of France, but all of a sudden it was here. Total war taking place in two oceans uh, on different continents, and all the young men were, were departing to take part in that war. So uh, that's what was happening in the country. Within the US Navy, of course, chaos and recrimination prevailed because the attack had come as a surprise. Although, although we knew something was going to happen at Pearl Harbor, I mean, we knew something was going to happen in the Pacific. We knew we had our fleet in Pearl Harbor, but somehow we didn't see the attack coming. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of finger pointing. Careers are going to be ruined. Uh, but there is a recognition in the Navy that we need to ramp up our intelligence gathering instantly. And, uh, and we need uh, it's hard for us to believe because we live in Washington now with the prolifer proliferation of so many intelligence agencies in this area. Of course, now we have the CIA and the NSA and the DIA and whatnot, uh, military intelligence agencies. But we didn't have any of that in World War II. And, and we had a very small intelligence apparatus. It had obviously failed at Pearl Harbor. It was going to take, the OSS was starting to ramp up, but it was going to take a while to get any kind of spy network built in these countries that we were suddenly, you know, at war with, but communications intelligence, the interception and decryption of, of messages, of radio and telegraph messages that were racing all over the world. I mean, this was a, this was a far-flung global war in which commanders and politicians and diplomats needed to be able to communicate over public airwaves for thousands of miles. So if we could snatch those out of the air and decrypt the encrypted messages, uh, then we could have immediate access to battle plans, strategies, diplomatic musings. Uh, and so that's what we set out to do. But of course, the men were gone. Uh, the men who could do that now were out to sea and fighting. So the Navy got the bright idea to look for women's colleges. So there's a, there's a document in the National Archives that I found where actually this document is from October of 1941, where somebody literally has the bright idea, OK, the men are gone who could do this. So let's, uh, let's try for the women. So, um, so And let's do it fast. So 
that was from, that, actually that memo was from September, so you can see in October, initial contacts with certain women's colleges regarding cryptanalytic training of seniors. So that's what was going on at Goucher. And this was actually a little bit before Pearl Harbor. Um, so you can see that the Navy already knew that it was going to have some catching up to do. And along with Goucher, they contacted the Seven Sisters schools. So, uh, so a number of the women I interviewed for this book, it's Smith, Wellesley, Radcliffe, Bryn Mawr, Mount Holyoke, Barnard, Vassar, uh, got secret invitations in the fall of their senior year uh, in which they were summoned into meetings often with math professors or astronomy professors and they were asked two questions. Do you like crossword puzzles and are you engaged to be married? And <laughs> Because it was plausible that they would be. Uh, and in fact, there was a lot of hasty marriage uh, and hasty engagements taking place as the men shipped out. So the correct answer to the first one was yes. The correct answer to the second one was no. And in fact, a number of the women lied. Uh, because whatever they were being invited to do, it sounded really interesting. And, uh, <laughs> and so, uh, and so not only at Goucher, but at all of these women's colleges, these courses were secretly taught 1941, 1942, so that the women could even just get a bit of background in, in, in this, this thing that they had never heard of called cryptanalysis. So that's what the Navy is doing in 1941. Meanwhile, the Army, the US Army, not to be left out, also has enormous code-breaking responsibilities. At this point, we're negotiating with England over who's going to have responsibility where. England, at this point, takes lead responsibility for code-breaking in the Atlantic, although we are also very much involved in that. Uh, oh, we don't, we don't trust each other at first, but, um, but our convoys are taking men and material to England. We're, uh, we're at the mercy of the U-boats, and so we care very much about the Atlantic, but the England, England is the senior partner. But we have lead co-breaking responsibility for the Pacific Ocean, not only the Navy, but the Japanese Army, which in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor, of course, Japan has taken Guam, Japan has taken the Philippines, Japan has captured an enormous amount of territory that's now being held by the Japanese army, and that's our army's problem. So uh, the US Army decides, okay, if the Navy has sewn up the women's schools in the Northeast and even the Mid-Atlantic, uh, we're gonna hit upon a different strategy. So the Army decides, to go for teachers' colleges, because this is where you can also find college-educated women and also school teachers, period. And their strategy, and this is literally true, is that they're going to send young, handsome army officers <laughs> to post office and hotels, particularly throughout the American South, because uh, it's believed that Southern women are particularly susceptible to the charms of a handsome man. <laughs> And again, like marriage is, I, I, there are literally oral histories in which the, the army officers are, are laughing about this ruse and congratulating themselves on getting these barefoot girls from West Virginia. Uh, and so uh, one of the women uh, who was called in actually to meet with her dean of women is uh, Dorothy Ramali, who's at Indiana State Teachers College in Pennsylvania. Uh, also, my central character, the woman who'll have her um, her party tomorrow, Dot Braden, who is the oldest of four children in Lynchburg, Virginia, daughter of a single mother, uh, attended Randolph-Macon Women's College in Lynchburg. Her mother, uh, her mother was supporting the family as a secretary at a uniform factory, which was, again, one of the few jobs that a woman could expect who needed to be in the labor force and wasn't college educated. And her mother thought, well, at least Dot, if she goes to college, she could expect a slightly better job teaching school. So in 1942, Dot took her first teaching job at Chatham High School. Uh, all of the men teachers, all of the male teachers had left. A lot of the female teachers had left to marry the men. So she was teaching English, French, physics, Latin, hygiene. She was marching the girls back and forth to lunch. She was completely exhausted. And at the end of that year, she said, she came home to Lynchburg and she said, Mom, they dumped everything on me. I am not going back to that school. And her mother said, well, I've heard that there's a recruiter at the Virginian Hotel in Lynchburg. I don't know what he's recruiting for. Uh, and Dot went and she just signed on the dotted line. Because whatever it was, it was going to be easier than teaching school and it was going to pay more. She was making $900 a year as a school teacher in Chatham, Virginia. And now she would be making $1,440 a year working for the US government doing what she did not know. Uh, so Dot, like thousands and thousands of other young women, takes the train. Uh, and finds herself in Washington Union Station um, with two hardback suitcases, her umbrella, and her raincoat. And she had no idea what she had signed up to do. Um, 
she finds herself, like many women, uh, well, uh, actually, she's not yet at Arlington Farms, but um, she goes, she takes a cab, uh, and you'll see, you'll see this in the book. I, I don't want to give too much of it away, but she takes a cab into Arlington, Virginia. She has no idea where she's going. She doesn't have very much money with her. The cab ride seems to be going on and on forever, and she's starting to worry that she's actually not going to have enough money to get where she's going. And she is brought to this place, and she remembered wire. She remembered a lot of wire uh, and, uh, and inducted into this odd building. And she suddenly, before she knows it, she's signing a loyalty oath. She's signing a secrecy oath. She is, uh, she's, she's agreeing under uh, you know, penalty of death actually, not to reveal what she's going to be doing in this compound. And she didn't still didn't know what she's going to be doing. Uh, and then as she goes through this, um, she goes through this exercise, and then the, uh, the person who's actually a young woman, uh, and I interviewed her as well, she's a young woman at the time, who's, who's inducting all of these young school teachers from the South uh, into their new work, uh, she, they say, well, do you need a bus to go wherever you're staying? And she says, where I'm staying? And she thought that the US military would provide her with lodging for whatever war work she was going to be doing. But no, I mean, this won't surprise anybody um, right? who works for the government. Uh, um, and, she, uh, and she had also had to pay her train fare to come to Washington. So, uh, they, put, so they sent her to this place called Arlington Farms that is um, over somewhere near Fort Myers. I mean, I looked at the map to try to figure out where Arlington Farms wa was, because it's, it's, it's not there anymore. Uh, but it was hasty temporary housing that Eleanor Roosevelt had, uh, had ordered be built very, very quickly to house these thousands and thousands of young G girls who are coming to Washington to serve the war effort. And it was known very quickly in Washington as 28 acres of girls. And in fact, another reason that I'm grateful to Arlington Public Library and the Arlington Historical Society, which puts out a great scholarly magazine, is there was an article that, that also they had procured for me on Arlington Farms. And uh, there was a lot of fraternizing at Arlington Farms. The young women who came up, 7,000 young women living in Arlington Farms, um, there was a lot of coming and going with soldiers. So there were some handsome young officers, in fact. Uh, and and the, the, the head of it uh, was criticized, actually, by the amount of fraternizing that he allowed at Arlington Farms. And he replied memorably, I am not running an, an old maid's home. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's where she found herself. And this is actually a photograph taken by a photographer named Esther Boobly, who, uh, and these are all available at the Library of Congress. There are hundreds of them documenting life at Arlington Farms. They're wonderful to look at. You can find them online if you just Google her, uh, Esther Boobly. Um, so you know, this could have been Dot. That's exactly the way she remembers looking. But that's not her that we know of. We actually don't know who it is. So this is where she finds herself working. Arlington Hall in Arlington, Virginia, a uh, former girls' school that's been requisitioned by the Army, still there. Uh, if you're driving along Route 50, you can glimpse it through the trees. And that's the way in which reporting this book has really changed my understanding of, of our landscape. Not only all these garden apartments that were built, but Arlington Hall uh, had been you know, a very posh girls' school. The girls took classes in deportment and posture and horseback riding. And um, and the Army had kicked him out, uh, taken it over, and built temporary housing. So this is actually not housing, temporary workspace on the grounds where there used to be bridal paths and tea houses and ponds. And that's where Dot would find herself working the next day after she takes the bus back from her new dorm room at Arlington Farms. Um, she had, still didn't know what she was going to be doing, except that it was top secret. And uh, just to give you a sense of how many school teachers had been recruited, uh, well, so she starts, she gets some hasty training for a couple of weeks. Um, these are young women uh, learning the geography of Asia because they're going to be code breaking the Pacific Ocean. And then this will give you a sense of just how many young women, civilian women, there were working inside that temporary building at Arlington Hall. And what Dot was trained to do very quickly was look at the shipping messages that were being sent every day by the supply ships that were plying the Pacific Ocean to take troops, fuel, food, medicine to the Japanese army troops that were holding all of these islands. They had to be supplied regularly. And we were intercepting these messages every day, all day, hundreds of messages a day. They were uh, code groups. They were four-digit code groups, so a word maru, which is, for, is the word for their supply ship. 
uh, might be rendered as 6281. And then they would encipher it by adding another number to it so that it would travel through the air, not as the code group, but as an enciphered code group. So these school teachers had to learn within a matter of days how to strip out that encryption, how to look at a message, do the math, learn where the word Maru might appear in the message. That was a good way to get a start. Or, uh, where, or the word troop, or embarking, or debarking, or, um, or Hiroshima or uh, Rabal, these, these, these terms that Dot had never heard of before. She had to suddenly learn how to spot in a message. And as she was, as she was trying to recall for me, I'm just going to click through quickly uh, to give you a sense of how um, these are women who are receiving. We would intercept the messages. We would encrypt them ourselves as, uh, as they were traveling to Arlington Hall from the Pacific. So women would have to strip out our encryption in order to get down to the encrypted Japanese message. Uh, so it was incredibly complicated. And uh, I'll stop here. But one of the things that uh, one of the things that Dot remembered is that she would be looking for these words and doing the math in her head. And when she got a message that seemed important, she would jump up and take it to a woman named Miriam, who was the overlapper. And Miriam was from New York City. And, uh, and she and Dot didn't get along very well uh, because Miriam, as Dot put it, was the most condescending New Yorker she had ever met. <laughs> and um, and I, I come from not far from where uh, from where Dot lives, and so as a Southerner, I, I did. Um, I didn't identify a little bit, uh, because there was a South-North conflict in Arlington Hall, because they did recruit from the North as well. And I even found documents that, uh, in which uh, there, was, there was a male uh, editor from New York who had been recruited to help. He was too old to fight, so he was helping. And he referred to the Southern women as the jewels. And the reason he did was because there were so many women named Opal or Pearl or <laughs> Ruby or Velvet. And so, or no, there was a velvet, but of course that's not a jewel. But there were also some jewels. And I did interview a jewel uh, from South Carolina, from Winthrop College in Rock Hill, South Carolina, who had been recruited as a high school band director. Uh, so, um, so there was some clash. It, because these women are coming ultimately from all over. Uh, and so there are some interesting uh, frictions. And meanwhile, so Dodd is sitting at the cafeteria table, uh, and Miriam's saying things like, I have never yet met a Southerner who can speak proper English. And Dodd is, is looking at the diamond on Miriam's finger thinking, um, well, I think that diamond's probably not real, and neither is your fiance, who you allegedly have. So, uh, so Don and Miriam didn't like each other a lot, but they had to work together on this incredible cryptanalytic assembly line that was very, very quickly established, because they were breaking those messages. They were breaking hundreds of messages a day, and the contents of the message would say often where a ship, where a supply ship was going to be at noon the next day. There was something, it's not a very secure practice that the, that the Japanese ships were doing. They were, they were telegraphing where they were going to be at noon the next day. And what better piece of intelligence for an American submarine commander than to know where a ship is going to be at noon the next day. So, uh, so they were, and, and Dot remembers running to Miriam, the overlapper, uh, and, and she would have been because they had to get those messages deciphered quickly and get the intelligence out to the submarine commanders who didn't know where the intelligence was coming from. Uh, they wouldn't see the actual messages. They would see the intelligence from the messages. There were other women who were doing traffic analysis, so the, they're just not the content of the messages, but just where they're coming from, where they're going to. It's something, these wartime operations would become the NSA. So this was what the NSA does now, sometimes is traffic analysis, sometimes of our emails, uh, to see you know, who they're coming from and where they're going to. Uh, so that's what women were doing. They were, um, they were maintaining a human Wikipedia section so that as people were breaking messages, if they needed to know a ship name or a commander's name or you know, was this a significant person, uh, they would call the, the information desk uh, that was maintaining shipping files, names of, of Marums that they had gotten from Barclays, uh, uh, or no, from Lloyd's of London that had shipping registries of commercial ships that had been transformed into army supply ships. Uh, so this was the overlapping group. And I, I found these photos at the National Archives. I love them so much. One of these women might have been Miriam. I mean, who knows? Uh, this was another group. This was a very important group of women. Uh, uh, the woman who you see with the dead plant uh, laughing down at her work was recruited out of Russell Sage College at age 22. She and a West Virginia school teacher named Wilma Berryman, who was presumably one of those barefoot girls from West Virginia, they broke uh, the Japanese army address code, this address that was appended to the beginning of every message. And because they broke that, and that was a discrete 
message system. It was, it was enciphered in a different way than the rest of the message. But because they broke that and figured out how it worked, we were able to know who was headquartered where, who, and when messages were going to, uh, to a new unit, if, if, if messages started traveling in a, in a, to a new place, that would suggest that the Japanese were on the move, that, that a new unit was being set up. So they were able to comprise every day what was called order of battle and, and, and give a report every day to the Pentagon uh, compiling what we knew from these address codes about where the Japanese army was, how many troops were there, where it looked like they were headed. So every day, order of battle would be drawn up based on the address codes and sent to the Pentagon. So this was really important military intelligence that the women were, were working in addition to breaking the messages. And just the woman who laughing down at her work with the dead plant would rise to become the first female deputy director of the NSA, Ann Kara Christie. I interviewed her five times uh, before, unfortunately, she died in 2016 before the book was published. Um, but she knew that she knew that it was going to be published. Um, this was another group of women who were, uh, it's, it's hard to overstate how many messages, how many different message systems were traveling all over the world at any given time. So the Japanese diplomats were using a completely different system. Japanese diplomats in Europe were communicating back with Tokyo. This was a system called PURPLE that if you know anything about wartime code breaking or have an interest in it, you might have heard of PURPLE, which was a system that produced a kind of intelligence that was called magic. It took me a long time to understand that PURPLE and as it were sort of the same thing. I got confused. But, um, but that, that system was broken by a woman named Genevieve Grochen before the war in 1940. And because of her insight, we were able to read what the Japanese diplomats were saying to the home office in Tokyo about their conversations with Hitler and Mussolini and Axis leaders. So thanks to that intelligence, among many other things, we knew where the coast of France was particularly well fortified and where it was not particularly well fortified in advance of the D-Day landings and planning where the D-Day landings should take place. So these women were reading that diplomatic traffic. These women were working other Japanese diplomatic systems. There was an African-American unit. The Army had a segregated unit. Uh, of African American cryptanalysts, probably school teachers as well, who were working the commercial codes of the private sector, enciphered messages traveling with companies from companies and banks. They were to see who was doing business with, with Germany or with Japan, who was doing business with Hitler or Mitsubishi. They weren't supposed to be, obviously. So, uh, so that was a really interesting and important unit. There were other women doing cybersecurity, uh, encrypting our own messages to keep them safe, uh, looking if, if we were looking for uh, problems in our military traffic. And also, I love this part, planning deception programs. So another thing about the D-Day landings, when we, were, uh, when we were about to embark on the landings, it was very important, that, obviously, that the Germans not anticipate that it was about to happen and not know where it was going to happen. So these women studied our military radio traffic and learned it with such precision that they were able to create dummy traffic, which was fake uh, American mil or allied military traffic to persuade the Germans that we had a huge contingent of troops poised to make a landing in the Pas de Calais region of France, and it worked. It was a, a fictitious. It was a fictitious first army called FUSAG that was allegedly led by Patton, uh, and it did not exist. But they convinced the Germans that it did exist, and they had, that had to continue happening even after the landing so that the Germans wouldn't relocate their troops from the Pas de Calais region. So that just goes to show you know, how, um, how massive this, this effort was. Meanwhile, all those women recruited from Goucher and, uh, and the Seven Sisters were actually waves. Uh, so the Navy had a slightly different operation. This is Nebraska Avenue. And again, I'll never look at Nebraska Avenue the same way, just as I never look at Route 50 the same way, uh, because this was where the Department of Homeland Security is now. It had also been a girls' school called Mount Vernon Cemetery. Girls were kicked out. They had to take classes in Garfinkel's department store until, uh, Mount, Ma until Mount Vernon could find a new location. So they're doing top secret code breaking work also at the compound on Nebraska Avenue and living in barracks across the street. And there are some wonderful anecdotes, I find, from women uh, about living in the barracks. Um, 
Just, I'll just tell you one of them because I loved it so much. Uh, actually, a very, a very wealthy young woman from New York uh, who thought she would actually be inducted as an, as an officer into the waves, um, but uh, she ha had only attended music school. She didn't have four years of college, so she found herself in an enlisted uh, capacity. Um, and it was actually when she went down to enlist, uh, she was very nearsighted. And she had uh, memorized the eye chart because there were eyesight. Uh, well, the women had to meet the same requirements, actually, as the men did in the Navy, even though they weren't going to be allowed to go overseas. Uh, and so uh, she got through the eye chart. But then she got to the naked physical part, uh, which was also something that men in the Navy had to undergo, like a group naked physical. And, uh, and so she had gone to a very posh uh, girls' school on the Upper East Side. She'd never seen another woman naked. And, uh, and all of a sudden, she had to strip down. And someone came and they wrote the number 10 actually between her breasts. And they said, now go stand between 9 and 11. And because she was so nearsighted, she had to go around peering. <laughs> and, uh, and again, this might sound like a tall tale, but when I was reading oral histories and memoirs, a lot of women remembered that naked physical. Um, <laughs> And uh, and so it was. And, and when she came to when she came to Nebraska Avenue, she lived in the barracks and she loved it. She had not enjoyed New York debutante society, and so she was living with a, a young woman from the Midwest whose father ran a funeral parlor, and he had given her as a Christmas present a music box in the shape of a casket. And so she said every day I had to get up and I had to say, Oh, Dottie, what a lovely casket! I mean, what a lovely music box. So, but that was the. I mean, the women were uh, ultimately when the waves were created, even women who did hadn't gone to college, but who had enlisted and showed aptitude, were funneled into the code-breaking operation. There were 4,000 women working up at where Homeland Security is now. There were 7,000 women working in Arlington Hall. So there were 11,000 women at least doing this work. Um, so the Navy women were working. I love I loved these photos. Uh, I, again, I found them just floating around in the National Archives. The Navy women were working the codes of the Japanese Navy and they were doing work similar to what DOT was doing, but the Navy was using a five-digit enciphered code. So many of the women were doing uh, what was called recovering additives. So they had to look at these columns of five-digit numbers and try to sub figure out what that enciphered group was and subtract it out to get down to the original code group. And I interviewed women in their mid-90s who remembered that work, who tried to actually show me what, uh, what they were doing. And the only reason it was hard was because I was trying to follow it. And I kept saying things like, wait, so you were, you were subtracting or you were adding? And they would sort of get impatient and say, I, was, I would zero eyes and add. Like, you know. Um, uh, so uh, they were doing that work. And when I was in the National Archives, Again, trying to confirm their memories. I found these extraordinary documents you know, that not only confirmed that they were covering additives, but they remembered the Japanese word shogoichi, which was the word for noon position. And they were looking for shogoichi messages that, again, that would announce the noon position of the Japanese ships uh, so that it could be radioed to the submarine ca commanders. And I found that word shogoichi in, in these memos that the women still remembered 70 or 75 years later. Uh, and I also found memos that showed how they were responding to what was going on in the Pacific after the Battle of Midway, which was our great code-breaking triumph in June of 1942, when we were starting our pushback across the Pacific, the amphibious landings that our Marines and Navy were making, uh, the women would, they would receive messages from their commanding officers saying, something's about to happen. We need more additives recovered, more additives recovered. You need to break your record from last week. Last week was 2,000. We need more than that. And then you would see messages congratulating them, saying, you know, you not only, you not only matched what you did last week, but you exceeded your records. So the women were sort of, they were attuned to what was going on in the Pacific. And and they were told, of course, never to tell anybody outside the code-breaking compound what they were doing or, or use words like additive uh, that would, might reveal what they were doing. So the Navy women even had conveyor belts. Um, and, and again, I just love these photos. They're, they're rare photos of the, of the interior of that compound. Um, and again, one of the women I talked to, the same woman with the naked physical anecdote, said, the Japanese sent so many messages. We never, there was never a time when we didn't have a stack of messages. And we could tell what was happening in the Pacific because the stack would get larger. Uh, and of course, again, many of these women had brothers and, and, and fiancés who were in the fighting. Uh, 
And some of them actually knew what was going on on their brother's ships. Uh, and there was one woman who was able to actually tell her family that her brother was safe. Uh, and, they, and she couldn't tell them how she knew, but she could just tell them that he was safe. Uh, there was another woman who was the watch officer the night that they broke a message saying that her brother's ship was about to be hit by a kamikaze. Uh, so th that was the sort of deep awareness that they had. There were other women who were decoding American messages that had casualty lists on them. So even, even when we were winning, even the battles that we won, they knew what the cost was of those engagements. This is just, I, these, again, these are in the National Archives. These are worksheets. This is the five-digit Japanese naval code that they were working, trying to subtract out the additives, trying to do some um, uh, conjectures of what the, what the language was showing. Uh, this is another uh, a di completely different cipher that was being used by Japanese communicating between islands. Actually, uh, students of the Pacific War know that there was a pivotal moment in the war when we were able to uh, when we were able to break messages that told where Admiral Yamamoto, who was the architect of Pearl Harbor, was going to be flying on an inspection tour, uh, and we knew down to the second what his itinerary was going to be, there were women working that inner island cipher, uh, building that itinerary, and, and the decision was made to shoot his plane down. And there are oral histories that the women write of the cheering that went up in the naval annex mm -hmm. compound uh, when they knew that that plane had been shot down as a result of the code breaking. Uh, these are just uh, this is something that Dot would have seen actually in the uh, in the Army facility of the four digit Japanese Army code. Uh, this was a different group of women. Um, uh, just to talk a little bit about the Atlantic Ocean, as the war went on, we became equal partners with the British in breaking the Enigma codes that the Japanese, U, that the German U-boats were using. Uh, you might have seen the imitation game when Alan Turing has this moment of inspiration. He understands how the uh, German naval U-boat code works. Uh, the Germans actually became suspicious after that, that we were reading their uh, their cipher system, and they changed the Enigma machine and added a rotor, and we couldn't read it anymore for eight months, and, and we were losing ships in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and so there was a top, top secret project to build uh, sort of bigger, faster machines that could break that four rotor Enigma code. There were women who were helping build those machines in Dayton, Ohio, who then came down to Washington and were running them. This is, this is what the machines looked, at, looked like. They could, uh, they could detect the key. They could detect the rotor setting, which changed every day in the German U-boats, uh, and then run it. Uh, and so those machines were actually used just to detect what the setting was. And then the message would be run through smaller machines that would actually decode the messages. Women were working those machines. They were um, also translating the messages from German into English. And then they were writing up intelligence reports that would be given to the military. And uh, these were just some of the women uh, in Dayton who were wiring the rotors. And actually, they had a really good time in Dayton. Uh, and, and had a good time in, in Washington also, although the work itself was very stressful. And, um, and just to go back, yeah, just to go back, uh, one, one, uh, one way in which the landscape of Washington was forever changed for me, there's a chapter in the book where the women working the German naval codes are actually, um, the night of June 6th, uh, 1944, uh, one of the women recruited from Wellesley describes walking into the naval annex to uh, start her midnight shift in the German section and thinking, they know that the D-Day landing is going to happen, uh, but she looks at the full moon and she doesn't think it's going to happen on a full moon. So she thinks that there won't be any landing tonight. And she goes to her, uh, she goes to her position and then about at about 1.30 in the, in the morning, our time, the messages start coming in from the Germans. Uh, and, and they say things like, enemy landing at the mouth of the Seine. So the German U-boats uh, and also the German army are, are, the women who are breaking these messages are experiencing the D-Day landing from the point of view of the Germans. So as the Germans are saying, oh my god, there are you know thousands and thousands of allied ships on the horizon. Oh my god, it's really happening. Oh my god, it's happening in Normandy, not in the Pas de Calais. Uh, they, they are reading these messages. So they know that the landing is happening. Again, they have fiancés. They have brothers in the fighting. Uh, they, they, can, they, can, they can hear the Germans talking, essentially, but they don't completely know how the landing is going or whether it's successful or how many lives are lost or you know, which glider pilots have, have survived and which ones haven't. And so uh, she writes in her memoir about you know, sort of 
feeling the, the might of the Allied effort and feeling overwhelmed by it, and also feeling at the end of her shift exhausted and overwhelmed, not completely knowing how many Allied lives have been lost, and going catching the bus at 8 o'clock in the morning to go to St. Albans Church right next to the National Cathedral, which is open all the time, all night during the war, and praying because the women didn't know what else to do. And I have to say, after um, reading that, I... Uh, I will, never, I will never drive by St. Albans Church, actually, and not think about that uh, anymore. Um, so in addition to those moments, uh, oh, sorry, I'm going backwards. Um, the women were having a good time in Washington. They were, uh, they were sending a lot of letters to uh, men. They were, in fact, my central character, and this was true of many of the women, they corresponded during the war uh, with men they would marry. And my central character, in fact, gets engaged to her husband purely through correspondence. And this was so common that I kept saying to her, wait, you, you hadn't seen him, right? He hadn't come back, right? You, you, all hadn't, you were doing it all through the mail. And, and she just said, yeah. I mean, she's like accepted that that was how they became engaged because it just wasn't unusual at the time what her... Uh, what her husband didn't know was that she was actually writing five or six men um, <laughs> during during the course of the war. And but that was and she was actually she was actually reluctant to, to tell me that for a while. But um, but what, again, one of my uh, one of the things I'm grateful to for the records here is is the piece on Arlington Farms confirmed that there was actually one young woman who was writing twelve uh, men. And and it was actually quite common. Women were told that they needed to keep up soldier morale. And so you know, they they were often quite innocent. You know, letters just just literally writing to cheer up these men, many of whom they had never met, uh, just just doing what they could to uh, to uh, for the service of, of morale and sending uh, these small snapshots that they were taking incessantly. This is um, Dot actually writing to her fiance, "Aren't we cute?" Carolyn is the other of this twosome. Now, Carolyn was an awesome code breaker. Uh, from Bourbon, Mississippi, a school teacher who would ultimately end up working for the NSA. So they're writing these cute little, you know, here's what we're doing on the beach, because that's all they could say. They couldn't tell their fiancés and husband like the incredibly important work that, that they're doing. Uh, and so this is, this is, again, an Esther Bubley photo of the um, young women at Arlington Farms awaiting mail call. Uh, and this actually is Dot, my central character, and her friend Crow, Carolyn. She called her Crow. Uh, and they stayed friends for the rest of their lives. Um, she married uh, Jim Bruce, who she was communicating with. Uh, Crow, who's the shorter, uh, married a wonderful man. And uh, Crow insisted that Dot and Jim come up and meet her husband before she would consent to marry him, because Dot's, um, um, Dot's uh, imprimatur was so important to her. And I'll just end with this photo just to talk about, you know, it's very hard for the women, as it was, of course, for men returning from war, uh, to adjust. This is a group of Navy code breakers to adjust to civilian life. And the work had been so stressful, but it had also been so urgent and important. They were living together in apartments or in barracks. They were often being fed. They didn't have any domestic responsibilities generally maybe for the first time in their lives. And, uh, and then all of a sudden they're, you know, thank you very much. The Navy women get a medal. They're told never to show it to anybody. They're told thank you for your service. <laughs> never talk about what you did. Never use any words that you used in the compound again for the rest of your lives. And the women took this very seriously. I had to pull the stories out of a number of these women and convince them that 75 years later it was OK to finally talk. <laughs> um, no, in fact, really Dot, who you saw, she at one point she said, well, you know, what are they going to do, send me to prison? And, um, and and I said, at your age, it'll probably be a nice prison. And, uh, and, and that finally convinced her to use words like overlapper that she had never uttered in 75 years and never uttered outside the compound of Arlington Hall. So this was a group of Navy women that missed each other so much after the war. They were all, all of course, told, go home, don't show anybody your medal, get married, have babies. And they did. But they were suddenly living very isolated lives. Some of them were really traumatized by the stress of the work that they had done, particularly the women working the German codes. Um, and they, they were isolated. They couldn't get appliances because factories had been churning out tanks and bombers and, and not washing machines. And, uh, and so they were wringing out sheets you know, over the, in the bathtubs and taking care of little babies and, and missing each other. So this group of women who were such good friends at the Naval Compound uh, started something that I'd never heard of called a round robin letter. And uh, 
it, you, the way it works is I would write a letter about how my day was going. I'd send it to the second woman. She would write her own letter. She would send both letters on to the third woman, write her own, send three on to the fourth. It would make its way all the way around, and then I would take out my old letter. I'd write a new letter, and it would travel around the circle again. So that round robin letter kept going through the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, until I was doing my reporting. There were two women left, and they were still writing each other on almost a daily basis. Uh, and um, unfortunately, uh, one of the women died during the course of my uh, research, but Ruth Mursky um, from Queens, uh, right there, is still alive. And her email address is Ruth the Wave, uh, because they were code girls then, and they're code girls now, and many of them are online, and, um, and still emailing, and still so proud of their service that, uh, that that's her email handle. So um, I'll end there and, and take, take questions. I, I suspect. I suspect that there are people in this audience who can tell me things about Arlington Hall that I probably don't know. I suspect we have a very knowledgeable audience here. Can we applaud the lady? Oh, please, yes. Hi, everyone. Will you please take your questions to the microphone in the middle of the aisle? Thank you. I would always thank them for their service, and, and it was often the first time they'd ever heard that. I have read your book, and I think it's wonderful. Thank you. Um, but my question doesn't really have to do with the women specifically. You made a point um, in talking about how we totally broke Japanese codes that we knew so much that my question is, how did the Japanese not realize this? And you said that we had sent planes up and that they thought right. that Right. That was how we discovered exactly where they were uh, as far as fighting battles. But uh, was that enough? It's a great question. And you know, there are many, there are many uh, books on the code breaking in the Pacific War that attempt to answer that question. Just as you say, sometimes when we were um, sinking these supply ships you know, on a daily basis, thousands of ships, we would send up planes uh, and the Japanese, so the Japanese would attribute to being spotted by plane, or they would attribute it to coast watchers, uh, you know, who were uh, people, you know, fr from the islands who, w and there, there were coast watchers, uh, but, it, and after the Battle of Midway, you know, that particular uh, code breaking triumph did find its way into. Um, Walter Winchell's column and the Navy shut it down as fast as they could and they were very afraid that the Japanese uh, would, would get wind of that uh, because of course if they, if they knew they would stop using that code system and it would go dark. And it is, I mean it is still very surprising that, and I can't completely answer that question as to why they never figured it out. As I said, the Germans became suspicious sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Now in reverse, um, did the Japanese have code breaking I mean, did they do code? Is there any no, indication that they broke any of our codes? I, 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 I'm, I'm, I can't answer that question. I know that the Germans did, and the Germans mm -hmm. were reading our convoy code at, at one point, and, um, and actually the Americans were trying to convince the British that the convoy code had been broken, and because the British were slow to acknowledge it, and so we were, we were actually monitoring the British. You know, the Allies would, would uh, monitor each other's signals to try to convince them about, uh, about the Germans. And, and I, I'm not an expert on that aspect of whether, uh, whether the Japanese were breaking our codes. I will say that the Japanese and the Germans did not use women to the extent that the Allies did. And, and I think uh, several military historians impressed that upon me as something that we don't fully take into account when we're um, enumerating the reasons why we won the war. So Arlington Farms actually was on the eastern section of Arlington Cemetery. It's, okay. it's where the newer Thank you. parts Thank of the you. cemetery. There, there has, I mean, there are people that have written okay. that. So what's um, there now? Oh, the cemetery. The cemetery. Okay. Yeah, it's the newer section. Okay, okay, okay. Um, but uh, I, in researching significant people buried at the cemetery, I came across uh, Agnes Driscoll's name. 
and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about her. Yeah, I'd love to without belaboring it. I mean, she's a hugely important figure. Her name really should be chiseled into a building uh, here in D.C. or there should be a statue. She's the reason why we knew how the Japanese Naval Fleet Code worked. She had been a, a school teacher in Texas and she actually joined up during World War I uh, when, thanks to a, a legal loophole, uh, there, the, the, there, was, there was nothing in the, in the law that said that a naval yeoman had to be male in World War I. And when they realized that they were going to need clerks and secretaries, they actually inducted women into the naval reserves during World War I, and Agnes Driscoll joined up. She jumped, hastened to join up. The women were shooed out after the war, and the law was rewritten specifically to confine it to men. And that's why the waves had to be created in World War II. Um, but Agnes worked as a civilian for the US Navy after the war. And she spent the 1930s diagnosing that Japanese Naval Fleet Code, figuring out that that it was an enciphered code, even as it went through several iterations. Uh, and, and that took her a whole decade. And people remembered her turning the pages of a stolen Japanese code book with the uh, eraser of her pencil. And she trained the famous officers like Joe Rochefort and Thomas Dyer and other, um, and other naval officers who would then go out into the Pacific and be instrumental in the Battle of Midway. Uh, and then she gets shouldered out. Uh, by incoming naval officers actually during the war. So her best period is before World War II, but she's really the reason that we understood how that uh, naval code worked. Okay, I don't have a question, but a uh, comment, um, which I hope is a response to your question about our code in the Pacific. Uh, in the early days of World War II, maybe even before we were dragged into it, our code was broken quickly. There were a lot of problems with the code. And then finally there was a man who, I think he grew up on a Navajo Indian reservation. His father was a minister. And he got this idea that, well, we'll use a different language. And so they used the uh, Navajo language. Right. And so they called them uh, Navajo code talkers. Code talkers, yeah. And so the Japanese were never able to figure it out, even though with uh, you know modern uh, weaponry, even though they would have to say grenade or they would just right. use the word the uh, English word, uh, the Japanese couldn't. Right. That was it. We never yep. had to change the yep. code. Right. And not all of our codes were the were the Navajo uh, codes, but you're exactly right. And those were Navajo code talkers. And in fact, I did come upon an oral history of one wave who was also trained uh, in the Navajo language to do the code talking, because I guess we didn't have enough native Navajo speakers. Uh, but I think that's also a great example of, um, you know, I, I had that uh, caption that global war breeds inclusion. And, you know, that the, the Navajo code talkers are another example of how, in a global emergency, we were uh, willing to avail ourselves of the communication talents of a marginalized group of citizens who, you know, despite how they have been treated, did come forward to serve, you know, in a crucial, crucial and invaluable way. I, I'm just loving the book. I'm Thank you. right there with Dot Braden when she gets off the bus or when she gets there and like all her taxi fare, I mean, all her money goes to the taxi fare and yeah. she can't even pay the first month's rent. And it's just, I love the way you draw people in. Oh, thank you. Um, and I may have missed this at the beginning, but my question is, because I was a little late, but my question is, how did you come upon the idea for the book? And then what were your one or two biggest hurdles in terms of executing it? Sure, yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so I, I, uh, I'm fortunate to be married to somebody who reads uh, declassified documents for fun and pleasure on the weekends. <laughs> and, um, and my husband was actually reading a declassified history of Venona, which was the Soviet, our, our project to break Soviet code systems, which started during the war. It was top, top secret because we weren't supposed to be doing it because they were our ally. And this declassified history mentioned that 90% uh, of the people on the Venona project, which continued after the war, during the Cold War, um, uh, were women, that 90% of the people working it were women, and many of them were ex-school teachers. And I thought that might make for an interesting article or something. And I went out to the crypt Cryptologic Museum at Fort Meade and talked to the NSA historians who laid out this much larger story of women being recruited to break the Japanese and German codes. And the Soviet effort at that point was, was tiny. Uh, so I couldn't believe that this story hadn't been told. And I think much like NASA knew that the African-American female mathematicians of hidden figures, NASA knew about those women. And it took an author 
like Margot Lee Shetterly, who, uh, to, to write a book to make it known to the public. And similarly, the NSA had known of that, you know, about these women who came to work during the war. I don't think anybody fully appreciated how many there were, because unlike Bletchley Park, which was a centralized operation, we had the Army and we had the Navy. And I don't think that anybody had really looked at the numbers um, uh, to see that it was more than 10,000 women. Uh, but uh, so I thought it would be an incredible story to tell, but the hurdles, as Meredith mentioned, uh, were I didn't know if I could find any living women, and, uh, and I knew that they would be in their 90s, and I didn't know whether there would be any records, uh, because, you know, you'd think that the story would have already been told if they were. Uh, but, you know, and, and, and I think it's an important point, because the women were so good about keeping this secret. Uh, that their, their contribution was really on the verge of being lost. They had never talked about it. They had played by the rules. They took it seriously. Nobody ever told them that the vow of secrecy they took was lifted in the 1990s when men started writing memoirs, you know, the male naval officers. Nobody told them. In a way, like, when I found them, it was like, it was like you hear these stories of Japanese soldiers that stagger out from the jungle in the 1950s and they don't know the war is over. Like, the women were like that. They didn't know that it was okay to talk. And so they had just... They had just kept quiet, and as a result, um, I mean, this was the dawn of cybersecurity. They were doing cybersecurity. They were doing. They were hacking into enemy communication systems. So we still have this persistent notion that uh, that women don't belong in tech. You know that people will still posit this idea that maybe that's the reason there aren't more women in Silicon Valley. They're just biologically not fit, uh, which was that explanation proffered by a Google engineer this summer, when in fact. It's because the women kept the secret that, uh, that we don't realize that the women pioneered so much of the tech industry, cybersecurity and also computer programming. Um, so one of the hurdles was finding women. And uh, I just did it in uh, any way that I could. The NSA helped me find DOT. Um, I placed an ad in the World War II magazine's website uh, that led me to the woman who explained how the, she recovered naval additives. A friend of mine whose mother went to Wellesley, class of 42, went to visit her mother at an assisted living facility in Maine, and she came back and she said, I've got three for you. <laughs> and in fact, she had, she had said at the dinner table, you know, I have a friend who's working on this story, and the woman at the table raised her hand. She said, I was recruited to do that work, and I have a friend who did that work. And then, and then the other woman at the facility was the one who remembered the naked physical. Uh, so it, I, I also came to believe that at every assisted living facility up and down the eastern seaboard, there's at least one or two uh, women who did this work, if only somebody would ask them. Um, so that was a hurdle. And then I was afraid that... I was afraid that there wouldn't be corroborating information at the National Archives, and because, right, because historians would have written about it if there were. And in fact, so I thought I'd spend maybe a week at the National Archives. And in fact, I was there for three months because there was so much material. There were rosters, there were addresses, there were these memos about additive recovery, about the Shogoichi messages. I could see where the women moved. I could see when their names changed from maiden names to married names. These records had just been ignored. Uh, so uh, I, the hurdle turned out to be having a deadline uh, and, and not being able to spend a year at the National Archives. Um, so anyway, thanks for asking. <laughs> Can everybody hear her? Could you? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Is it wireless? Just, uh, just to make sure that everybody can hear. I mean, I was hearing fine, but I just wanted to... Both my mother and aunt okay. work, work there. So. I, I want to compliment you on, on your presentation because there is so much that you have said that has just brought it back out. I was teaching school in a little town called Oakland, Iowa, and the recruiter came out. He wasn't wearing a uniform. He was just dressed in a suit. Was he good looking? But he came out. <laughs> <laughs> but he came out, and for some reason or other, I'd been teaching for three years, and he just caught me in a day, and he said, uh, would you be interested in going to Washington, D.C. and working on the, something? You know, I don't remember exactly what he said. And it was about May, about the end of the year. Um, I was teaching for about, a, let's see, $80 a month. And whatever he said just kind of hit me right. And so I packed up. But they gave me my a ticket to go on the train to come to DC. 
I were paying at, the fare by then, yeah. I was met at Union Station. I was taken to Arlington Farms, and then I was t had the position, and then I was taken to Arlington Hall and, and signed up. And now I didn't work as a code breaker. I worked in the communications center. In other words, I was sending the communications for the good guys out to, the, to their units in, in, the, Euro, in the Pacific as well as in the, in the European area. You were doing cybersecurity. I mean, you were encoding and sending our messages. I was what? You were doing yes. cybersecurity. Oh, <laughs> sending our messages. Sorry. Yes, yes. And, and then we were getting messages in. And it was the communication center was full of ladies, like you said. There were two or three gentlemen. But it was ladies from the age of 18, and there was one that was 80-some years old that had been working on, on people's ge genealogy, that sort of thing. But she just wanted to do something for the war effort. She was the sweetest lady, and she fit right in with the rest of us. <laughs> we worked three shifts. There was a time later on where we just worked two, and the, there were some military guys that were working with us, and they, they covered the the uh, midnight shift, so we just worked the uh, day shift and the, and the uh, afternoon, mi mi early evening shift. Let's see, what else could I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. And then in 1972, she, she went on, uh, continued working, uh, for the government, and she received the uh, Meritorious Civilian uh, Service Award uh, yes. uh, medal. Well, thank you so much. I want to tell you that there was a jobs that were not code breakers, but we did see a lot of government, de you know, messages that went in and out of our comm center. But then I moved out because the guys were coming back from the service, mm -hmm. and they needed jobs too. So you can imagine one day I was sitting there, I had been married by that time and I had one daughter and I was pregnant with the third, second one. And the man came out and he said, there's a gentleman who's been in the service and he's going to have your job because he fits the category. So I thought, well, that's going to be, I'm going to go home and start raising a second child. But no, they said, there's a job for you, that you can take an interview for a job. And so what, what I, did was I went out on the interview, sat there with a very pregnant woman, you know, and took, and they gave me the job. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And that, that, that not only helped me, but it, I went from, let's see, I, I think I went from a five to a four because that's where they fit it in. No, I went from a six to a five. And he said, but you'll go from a five to a seven to a, and I, so I ended up, I retired as a GS-13. So, That's awesome, yeah. Remarkable. That's great. Thank you so much. I can't think of a better way to end the talk. Thank you all. Thank you. Great. All right. Any, I think any that's, other questions? <laughs> Then, no, I think that that's a great way to end the talk. So thank you so much for coming, and thank you so much for coming.